Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'd like to thank IDS for giving me a hangover this morning. There were quite a lot of parties last night. I hope some of you were able to enjoy them. A lot of great people I met. <clears throat> so my th throat might be a bit scratchy. I'll, I'll manage. Um, you probably think you haven't heard of the mountain Snohetta before, but you probably have in some way because it is in Norse mythology where Valhalla is situated and probably all of you have heard of the myth of Valhalla, the great palace. It's a beautiful mountain. Um, it, it embodies uh, landscape and architecture in a very interesting way and that is perhaps one of the reasons why we are um, associated with it. And as was mentioned, we do take trips to the mountain uh, every so often, and it's a nice way for all of our staff who are able to make it uh, to come together and, and uh, work together in a very active way. And this helps um, keep us close together because we are in many places, as was mentioned. We're a collaborative studio. Uh, there is no person named Snohetta, so this means that everyone in the office has a sense of authorship towards the projects. Some of the studios are highly self-sustaining, so the design work coming out of them is not being um, um, sort of managed by string pulling from others remotely. Um, people stand on their own, and the office is dedicated to finding ways to pull people together. So we ripped out all the traditional methods of forming a design studio. We don't have separate meeting rooms. We have just one big table. We all sit at the table, kind of like a big dining table. And we can have multiple meetings on the table. Uh, we can have uh, presentations, all kinds of things. There's no private offices. We also um, make it so that you enter through the kitchen, so there's no receptionist. Uh, so if you arrive as a visitor, you kind of come to the kitchen and you might see the beer tap uh, that we have there or the fruit bowl, which makes us look a little healthier, uh, that is also on the kitchen counter. Um, but it's nice to be in a kitchen and near a kitchen. Uh, you've probably been to parties where people kind of hang out around the kitchen because it seems less formal than other rooms. And uh, the kitchen then adjoins the space where uh, all of these kind of interactive activities occur. Um, we, we are always trying to pull in people from the outside, uh, people that are different than ourselves to talk to us during the design process. We're a mix of a number of different people uh, and different backgrounds, architects, landscape architects, interior architects and branding and graphic design. By the way, I do call in interior designers interior architects. I still don't understand why they're not called architects. It's very complex work. And, um, and so we, we um, try to push people around in different ways. So we call it transdisciplinary. Uh, a, an interior architect can be working with landscape architecture and vice versa. Uh, that's very important to us. The first project that we uh, received a commission for was way back in 1989. <clears throat> None of us were really over the age of 30. We were quite young. And we won the commission to revive the idea of the Great Library of Alexandria in Egypt one of the cornerstones of Western civilization. It took us 13 years to complete the project. Uh, we finished and it's still open despite the political challenges that have occurred in the region. It now has over 10,000 visitors a day. Many, many of them are young adults and young children. Then we went on to win the commission for the new National Ballet and Opera in Oslo, which was another uh, international anonymous competition. Both of these were anonymous, so it was not clear who the authors were. <clears throat> you feel like you're getting struck by lightning twice, uh, but it was a, um, a rather significant uh, resource for not only the city of Oslo, but the nation of Norway. Became a, an iconic representation of how Norwegians like to feel about themselves in their, their, their context of nature. So much of the opera is accessible uh, by walking on the roof. So it's a very generous building. And when you're on the roof, you can get up and see over the city. It's free of charge. Uh, and when you're there, you might think, oh, what's, what's underneath my feet? Oh, there's an opera there. Um, many people who've never gone to the opera now buy tickets and they're doing very well financially because it, the generosity of the design allows people to feel that they own the project themselves and they want to participate with what's in it. Sometimes <clears throat> the pieces, excuse me, <laughs> hangover again. Does anybody have any pastilles? <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, I'm 
sometimes the shows are very popular. And in this case, they were um, uh, having Carmen on the opera stage inside the building. Uh, there were so many people that wanted to buy tickets. As you know, Carmen is a very sexy opera, so it's always really popular. And uh, they had um, not enough space and not enough time uh, for all the people that were interested in seeing the show. So they simulcast uh, Carmen outside on the roof. 4,000 people watched it in the bitter cold of winter uh, by sitting outside, and 1,200 people sat inside, watched it simultaneously. It was very successful. They've since planned other concerts. Justin Bieber played there once, and there were 35,000 crying teenagers on the roof, which is, I think, the most uh, interesting life that that has had. <clears throat> There's informal uh, performances inside the building, and we worked with Olafur Eliasson to create some of the wall panels that you can see here that are the backdrop for um, less uh, organized or planned performances just in the lobby areas. So there are many types of possibilities, but most notably, of course, is the main hall, which is a traditional horseshoe-shaped room designed in the, as, in the style of the great theaters of Europe from 500 years ago. So in many ways, we try not to reinvent things, but to make them better. So the interior, in some ways, is a, is a is a very uh, the antithesis from what you experience on the outside. It's a contemporary, uh, very unfamiliar object with a, a very historical, familiar object inside of it. Uh, after that, we then somehow thought, well, that 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 was quite a lot. Maybe uh, something else will happen, and we were invited to submit a design or a, a sort of proposal for the new World Trade Center uh, Memorial Museum in, Washington, uh, in New York City after the terrible tragedies of September 11th in 2001. And somehow we managed to win. And there is a, our building is the tiny little building that you see there on the memorial grounds between the two pools that represent the former footprints of the two World Trade Center twin towers. Um, the building is a, a very horizontal and fits very much inside your, your field of vision, which is very unusual in New York City, which is primarily a vertical city. So many people uh, don't experience the, the, the qualities of objects in the city because much of their character is up above your field of vision and not a lot of people like to look up when they're walking down the street. But this building sits right there in the frame. It's, counter to the verticality of the surrounding buildings and it helps join the skyscrapers to the memorial. The memorial pools represent the lives that were lost and the names of the deceased are inscribed on the rails around the pools so they reflect the past. Our building reflects the present uh, so it's often said that the pools or the, the voids as they're sometimes referred to are reflections of absence and our building, we feel, is a reflection of presence. So you should always feel that you're there at a given moment in time uh, and that your association with the loss of life also projects forward to your possibilities and, and optimism uh, for the future. The um, facade of the building is etched with these very special kind of very, very small angel hair scratches so that there's always a reflection of light off of the building. This is the north facade of the building, so it gets no direct light uh, for most of the year. And you can see how much light is, is being projected off of this surface. No matter where you are uh, and, and at different times of year, you'll see it in a different light, quite literally. Um, it was a complicated building to build, as you well, would imagine. There were multiple owners on different levels on the site. We had to work with a new train station that was being built underneath our project while we were designing it. Um, to give you an idea of the scale of these things, that rusty looking I-beam in the middle there is about 13 feet high. So it's a substantial structural system just to manage to place this little building on the site. When you're in the main atrium, you're able to see two of the original structural columns that were rescued from the salvage effort uh, during the cleanup uh, after um, September 11th. <clears throat> and as they sit in the atrium, you can see beyond the new World Trade Center tower in juxtaposition to the somewhat beautiful but also highly tragic artifacts that are uh, mainly the, the, the core of this experience as you enter. But perhaps the thing that I like the most about the building 
and this is something that I believe is a thread in our work, um, is the, the way in which people directly interact and even make contact with the structure or the building itself. So if you go there, especially on a warm day, you'll see loads of people going up and pressing their noses against the atrium glass to see what's inside. And actually every day they have to come out and clean all the nose prints that are running there at about four feet off the ground and also lower ones from the children that do it too. And what happens is quite fascinating. So people will walk up to the glass, they'll stick their head right up to it to look inside. And when they look inside, First they see these wonderful uh, columns, but then they see that there are other people looking up at them because that's where the main atrium is. So there's a sort of moment of shock where suddenly there's a bunch of people staring at you and you're staring at them. And they, often people will jump back from the glass when they realize they're in this kind of voyeuristic situation. But at that moment, right there, when they look into the eyes of a stranger, they're recognizing their presence in time and their relationship to the society around them. And so there's a, a, a kind of an interesting, I, I suppose, narrative related to, to that idea in how the building operates. This is a little girl. One time I was there standing in the atrium and I looked up through the glass and I saw a little girl dancing, looking at her reflection in the glass. And when we started the project, we said if we could bring one smile to a place of such tragedy, then we would have accomplished our piece of a very complex puzzle. So that was a, a very a nice moment for me. Uh, during all that period, we started to acquire other projects in North America. One of them was the Hunt Library in North Carolina at a university called North Carolina State University. It's a primarily neo-Georgian campus with lots of red brick and semi sort of historical or quasi historical structures, but they wanted us and uh, the governor of uh, the former governor of North Carolina, Governor Jim Hunt, wanted us to make something that showed the future of the university through this library. Um, the building is actually very cost efficient and uh, had a very tight budget. It was built during the worst of the economic crisis in the early 2000s. And Ten million dollars were removed from the project during the middle of the design phase, so we had to find a way to, to make the same building <clears throat> with a lot less money. Um, but one of the features that I enjoy is the um, solar fins that you see here. These are vertical fins to help keep out ultraviolet light and maintain temperature in the building so that it's an environmentally sensitive structure. But at night, uh, when the lights on, on the inside are on and you approach the building, you get these very soft qualities of color. Um, the fins themselves are uh, various shades of, of, of white and gray, sort of 50 shades of gray on the, all of these fins. And uh, they turn sort of bluish when they in interact with the artificial light inside. Uh, there's a, two entries, but one of them connects directly to a student housing area. And when you go into that uh, student housing area, You'll start to see uh, an area, which I'll go one more slide uh, forward. Um, there's two large windows, and those two large windows look in to what is called the BookBot. It's a giant robot that holds two million volumes of books in the library. This allowed us to free up space for people to study and more, more space for people rather than books. But everyone was afraid that the, uh, this would make it such that the books would not get checked out anymore. Um, but the, the robot works really well. It, it can get you a book in five minutes for various technical reasons I don't have time to explain. But more importantly, um, when a book is, is uh, retrieved, it's like a discotheque in there. So the light's kind of dim and the, the robot's yellow and you can go to these windows and watch the robot get your book. And if you look in the middle of the two windows, you'll see a computer screen. You can actually go there and browse the books themselves, not just the titles, but they look like books. You can see what the books look like. And there's also, a, used to be anyway, an I'm feeling lucky button like you have on Google where you can just say, robot get me something and the robot will randomly select a book and bring it to you. <clears throat> so um, when they uh, successfully created the programs that ran the robot, then they made it such that if a book wasn't checked out for say six years, which happens a lot in libraries, books just sit there on the shelves. So 
So if somebody checked out a book that hadn't been checked out in a long time, all the information screens in the whole library would stop and they'd flash the name of the book and say, wow, this book just got checked out. And everybody would go, hey, maybe I'll look at it. So they've actually increased book uh, um, uh, use by some 30%. So um, actually, uh, book, book um, interaction has not gone down, it's gone up. Once you enter the lobby of the building, uh, there are these series of yellow stairs, which you saw in one of the previous pictures. Uh, here is the first one. And they move all the way through the building, and they're bright, bright yellow. They're yellow for several reasons. First of all, yellow is a, a color of focus and a color of energy. It's a kind of energizing color when you're wrapped in yellow. Also, we wanted them to stand out. And how do you do that? What color actually stands out? So we started looking at people, especially students, and tried to find what color is the least worn by people in clothing. So a lot of people wear blue, they wear red, all kinds of colors, but few people wear actually yellow. And like if I look out here tonight, there might be maybe one or two yellows. I think I see a yellow there. That's all right, you'll get lost in the staircase. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a kind of rare color, so um, it also stands out amongst the, the sort of hubbub of student life. The stairs act as social spaces. Um, what I could say is that we wanted the stairs to dominate uh, inside the building so that few people would take the elevator. Elevator obviously has to be a good experience for those that are not able to take the stairs, but we didn't want it to be the primary focus. So the elevators are in that weird, scary, gray, dark space past this bright, happy stair. So people will go to the stair and go, no, I'm going to take the lift, and then they get about halfway there, and they go, no, I don't want to do this, and they go back to the stair, and they'll take the stair. So there are people that have been in this building, it's five stories high, and they've never taken an elevator, which is pretty good in a place that's part of the, what I call the barbecue belt in North Carolina. Um, they, as you take the individual stairs, they take you on a little journey. There's always a surprise. Um, and then at the very top, the last stair, which is the last run as you've climbed already up four flights, you're bathed in yellow. And a lot of this is natural light. This is not artificial light. Uh, some of it is, but not all of it. And there's this kind of rush of emotion. And once you get to the very top, there's a balcony like this overlooking the uh, North Carolina landscape, which is rather exceptional. So people just um, take the stair for the journey and they know that there's a, a payoff at the end and that's an important part of the story. That project led us to being invited here to Toronto by Ryerson University to make their new student learning center on Young Street uh, at Gould, which is of course a very vibrant cult cultural and commercial area, but primarily commercial uh, sort of entities uh, define this part of the city. Um, you know, I, whenever I tell anybody uh, where the project is, if I meet someone, Canadians, and I say it's at Young and Gold, they say, oh, I don't know where that is, and so I say, it's where Sam the Record Man used to be, and everybody goes, oh, I know where that is. And if they don't know Sam the Record Man, they'll know the Zanzibar. So those are the two sort of <laughs> old uh, uh, monuments that somehow define this part of the space. But, but but um, they wanted to change that, the university. They wanted it to be more culturally accessible. It needed retail because the street has a retail personality. So we tucked the retail underneath a kind of ramp. You ramp up into the lobby and the, and the retail space is, is sort of lodged in to the ramp so that the two things could work together rather than being feeling separate. Once we did that, that meant there was a tilted plaza that was created. Uh, and that plaza we studied in terms of daylight in multiple ways, and of course, as you slope a surface, it gets more daylight hours, even if it may get less actual um, direct uh, sunlight uh, onto the surface. So that's why solar panels are often tilted rather than flat. But um, that the, the form of the building then sort of became a, a funnel for light, which is a very important part of, of uh, living in Canada, accessing daylight. Then we also decided to make the, the sort of um, mechanism that brought the light down this very unusual color of blue. And we, we came up with that color because <clears throat> we felt it reminded us of a warm day in the Caribbean islands somewhere. And this would make people happy in Young Street in the middle of winter. They would give you this kind of moment of, 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 uh, of uh, blue warmth because blue is normally considered a cold color, but when you think of it in other ways, it can feel warm. Uh, this is looking at the building through, on the right is a picture I took when I walked into one of the clothing, clothing shops, and they had oriented many of their models in the window to look at the 
building, which I thought was kind of funny. And um, then uh, as you approach still further, you find that the plaza where people used to play chess, it, was, it used to be a gathering place when Sam the Record Man was there, and we kept that, we maintained that idea. You rise up some steps, and then you find yourself under <clears throat> this great dome. And each of these panels is highly reflective and um, changes as your eye, the angle of your eye, or declination of your eye changes ac across the surface. So here's a sort of um, detail view taken like a selfie, just pointing straight up. Uh, and uh, you'll see in this next image that uh, I one day was there where they were having a party and there were cars going by and the, the, um, the, the billboards were flashing, you know, pictures of Victoria's Secret or something across the street. And this is a film that I, I took of that. So um, all of this uh, movement of light is being created by the reflection of the ambient light of cars going by, of uh, billboards, <clears throat> and a party that was going on in the street. And there's a very wide range of colors by this effervescent paint. So the, the panels themselves are rather fascinating. Each one is made of a single sheet of aluminum. A computer, kind of CNC device, um, scored the back of the sheet into the fold pattern that was necessary to make this triangular uh, shape. And then everyone was folded by hand. So these are all human beings folded those by hand after the computer scored them. So it's a really literally an origami building, uh, which is quite in impressive in, in today's industrialized culture. The panels move inside the lobby where there's a great room where you can collect and meet your friends, have coffee, just kind of hang out. There's a series of weird columns that don't make sense when you're in that room, but they actually do carry a fairly basic load structure all the way from the top of the building. I think people started to like the columns and they even dress them up every now and then because they're, they're sort of odd and they, and they have a personality. Um, as you move up through the building, you'll find that every floor is radically different. So the theory here was that you need to create diversity in buildings. So in this building where whoever you were, if you wanted a quiet space, you could find a quiet space. If you wanted a crazy space, you'll find that too. There's something really for everybody. And it would occur radically on each floor. So the floors were given names like the beach, the bluff, the garden, uh, um, the sky. And I'll show you a few of those now. Um, but what's important when you look at these pictures is you'll see that none of the, even though it's a pancake slab on top of slab type of building, all the slabs are also a little bit warped, so you never really know what's flat, what's straight, what's square. Um, you're constantly being challenged, but in a very delicate way. You're not being challenged like people are hitting you in the face. You're just kind of trying to, you're, you, you're often in a state of trying to understand what you want to do with your, yourself in this building. The first thing that happens if you get on the elevators, they're just saturated in color, or the fire stairs, which um, are also used to move up and down the building. And they, these colors change also no matter where you are, and sometimes the colors interact in very unusual ways. So you're shocked already just by moving into the uh, vertical transportation system. Each floor has a various kind of color scheme and volumetric idea. This is the, the, the bluff, which is just above the entry uh, area. And there are all these very interesting reflections. You often see yourself in the glass with other people behind. We, did, we made funny little nooks and crannies where you'll only find them if you spend time going through the building and trying to understand all its parts. Uh, there's a floor called the garden, which is saturated in green, and it actually uh, houses many of the, some student services rather than book collections. And what's really funny about this green color is we use green glass, and many people, they look at that, and they say, how on earth could you study in a space like this with green glass and green light? Because it would be awful to be in that space. But since light transmission is, is the key to um, defining color in a room, when the lights are on inside the space, it's perfectly normal because the color uh, flows out. When you turn the lights off, then it turns green. So here's a view of a, a cleaning person working on the desks and the exact same person once you walk in the room. So from the outside, you think it's kind of crazy. And from the inside, it's incredibly normal. And that's a, an unusual balance. But when you turn the lots, lights off, it goes to green again. And this is the floor called the sun with a similar issue where uh, you look inside and you think those people must be car um, you know, f uh, bathed in red. As long as the lights are on, it, it stays normal. But 
Interesting thing with this room is that a lot of people love the room when the lights are off. So they turn the lights off and sit in there just to be bathed in the, in the sun that's in this room. Uh, so it's a nice thing to see people using the space without the lights on. And then you move up to the beach, which is this crazy room that was mentioned. Um, there are no traditional tables or chairs. It's meant to feel like you're at the beach. The students love it. They go there, they read, they study, they talk to their friends. It's very highly charged, energized space. But we, you know, sometimes you have to be careful. We, we wanted a lot of things to happen at the beach. And sure enough, within the first week, students started showing up in bathing suits and beach balls with towels and things. And so the librarians were a little nervous about that. So I don't know what the policy is anymore, but uh, I don't think they allow you to wear a bathing suit anymore at the beach. Um, uh, once a week, there's a break dancing group that meets up there and does their break dancing while everyone's studying. So it really is a transformative space for the younger people. Some of the um, spaces are, are identified by the light that comes through this fritted pattern that's on the exterior of the building, which dapples the light, like the light that comes through leaves of a tree. And when you're sitting in the sky level, which is at the very top, it can very often be very zen-like. It's so quiet and calm, and the color is very soft. Exactly the opposite of the beach. Um, but one of the things that happens uh, very interestingly is that although we made detailed studies of daylight through these um, glass facades, there was one thing we failed to think about, and that is that during this time of year in Toronto, and this is a picture of downtown Toronto, of course all the steam rises up out of the mechanical equipment, and if there's a light breeze, the steam blows sideways at a very low level, unlike a cloud. So the sun hits the steam and goes into the space while the clouds are moving, and they move fast. And so I just was there one day, just before it opened, and I saw this uh, phenomenon. The, the next film you'll see is not sped up in time. It's actually live uh, time just from my little um, handheld camera. So when you're in there and these clouds start going by, it's just amazing. You have to stop what you're doing. And I've seen people do this. They'll stop what they're doing, get up and go to the glass to see, you know, is the world coming to an end or not. And, uh, and so, it, you know, it, it, it provides a break from, from, from things. So quite, quite interesting. I, I like the effect. It only happens a few times a year. We were just given uh, the commission to design the new public library in Calgary, which is on a very weird site where a train bisects the center of the site and a pedestrian corridor goes right through the middle of it. So it broke the site up into four quadrants. Very difficult to design for us. So we had to lift the building off the ground in ways that people could walk through and the train could enter without um, sort of changing the character of the functions and the, and the beauty of the building. Uh, we, when we started to make these early models on the bottom, people in Calgary told us about the Chinook Arch, which is a, a meteorological phenomenon that occurs in this region, very special, and I got to see one. And so we saw that there were things about the landscape and the quality of life there that could be brought into the building. Um, works of art that you find in different types of indigenous cultures in the Plains states also could be seen. And, some of the ways in which we developed the, the facade of the building. Um, there you can see the final design with the passageway that leads through and, uh, and underneath is, is where the, the streetcar goes. So in fact, in the main atrium inside, you'll see that it's curving and at the very lowest levels, it's terracing upward. That curve and that terrace is a mirror exactly of the streetcar that runs right through the building. So when you stand on that floor, you're directly over the streetcar line. And so it, it provided this great moment. We, uh, we, what we said, you know, when, they, when we got this project, they said, this is horrible. Everyone hated the streetcar line. And you know, you, who, who, who would want that running through their building? But our response was, if that streetcar weren't there, this building would be square. <laughs> You know, but you couldn't get around it. It was curving and ramping, so everybody had to make an organic design. And uh, you know, more than likely, given not, no limitations, people would have pressured things to become more traditional. So that was a nice moment. There's the streetcar line as it exists. So the building's under construction uh, right now. The the streetcar line's been capped, and they're going to start building up over the top. It opens uh, next year. Um, we also have another project in. In, uh, in Canada, in, uh, in Kingston at Queen's University, 
Um, you'll see here that this building is situated on the lake, Lake Ontario, not inside the campus of Queen's University, which has a lot of limestone and granite. And you'll see this kind of flash of light on the facade. Once again, we were working with daylight and how it can influence a building because this is the context of that site. This is what you see when you stand there and look out across the lake. It's phenomenal, really, uh, to see uh, such spaces. So we wanted to take advantage of that and take advantage of the reflections of light off of the snow, which is there, uh, and the ice many times of the year. So again, whenever you walk around the building, you'll be recognizing flashes of light uh, depending on the time of year and the uh, climate uh, as it exists. And here's a, during a more sort of warm period. And even then in the evenings, it begins to bathe in a sort of warmth. Uh, and as you look up or between some of the, the spaces, there are interesting framed views of the things around you. So you're always trying to be in contact with the place uh, that you're in. The lobby itself looks like it's cantilevered out over the lake, but that's in landscape terms what is called a ha-ha, which is a sort of dropping off of the landscape to make it feel that it goes, goes uh, further than it really does. It's a sort of optical illusion. Plus there's stainless steel on the ceiling which reflects Lake Ontario over your head when you're in the space, intriguing. The heart of the building is a live acoustic room that doesn't actually need uh, any, any uh, electroacoustics except for speech. And that room uh, is built with wood from uh, four different types of wood from the region around Kingston. So it's all local Canadian wood. And it's striated like the limestone patterns that you see along the lake, uh, not only in Kingston, but also here as you share a shoreline. Um, there's there's a, a, a wonderful rehearsal room that mimics the quality of that space uh, in 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 a in an area that can take anything from one uh, soloist to seventy uh, symphony members. Uh, so it's really wonderful sound in this building, and I, I guarantee, I urge you, if you have any love of music go to Kingston and see a show there. It's one of the few live acoustic rooms in the world that's uh, contemporary design. So the speakers that you see there were just down for testing. And as I say, they're only used for, for voice. But hearing, uh, being in a room with 560 people and only getting the sound that's coming straight from the performers, not through a microphone or through the speaker, is something not to be uh, missed. So it's only a couple of hours away, definitely worth a visit. You, oh, you can see the uh, rehearsal room from outside. Uh, the lobby is quite uh, interesting in that it connects to a film school above uh, the uh, auditorium and they're very low, a very cost efficient, low budget building. So we used, the wood that you see there is all taken from a building that was there that we tore down. And then we sawed all the wood up and used it as the, the wall surfaces and, and uh, the lounges for the students. Um, and there's some of the original building wood uh, that was there also that we incorporated into the new design for the back of house facilities. And this is a, a part of the student lounge and sort of tea room and copy room. Very lo low budget interior, but um, quite delightful in many ways, I think. Um, we're finishing off the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art expansion. When completed, it will be have more gallery space than even New York MoMA, so it'll be one of the largest, if not the largest, modern art museum in the Americas. <clears throat> so it's a rather significant project sitting behind a um, Mario Bota building that was um, built about 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's the art piece is this sort of white kind of um, frame behind or backdrop behind the Mario Bota building in the foreground. One of the things we wanted to do was open up all the alleyways that had been forgotten about in this block. They had been closed off because of buildings built there for so many years. To do that, we opened up the entire ground floor, made more entries into the building than exists today, and made it a free art experience. So there's 40,000 square feet of free, great art art experience that you can just walk through any time and not have to buy a ticket. The theory is that everyone will enjoy that so much that they'll want to go to the rest of the building and buy a, a ticket. So it may improve their financial conditions, again, to be a little generous. These are some of the passageways that were opened up to get you to the, to the alleys. Ladies and gentlemen, hmm. please join us in 15 minutes oh, I'm too, I'm at finished. the Caesar Stone stage. I have to stop. Located at the south okay, I'll, of I'll skip. one, two, 
two. I'll skip all that while she's talking. That's the gallery. It's really great. Great speaker of the day. Stairs. Um, but I want to show you one project. To welcome Lee Broom. Ooh, that's Once nice. Once again, it's I'll, um, I'll get through this. I want to close with one project. By the way, that's a view of it. It opens May 14th, 2014. This is about two month old, this photograph. Um, I have to skip all of Times Square. We're reconstructing Times Square. This is what it is. This is what it's going to be. So that's where it is now. We're taking all vehicular traffic off of, of Broadway. Um, so these are some of the plazas that we've been designing, uh, making space for more people. They've made it safer. We're, we're creating um, places for people to, uh, to perform. These really unusual benches, I have to skip these statistics. Um, I'm going to skip. I want to get to the last one because I only have a few minutes. But that's a playground, a five-story playground in Austria. Apparently, Austrian children are not afraid of heights. So this is a five-story playground that you can go up and down in, and you overlook the valley in Austria. It's rather beautiful. You've seen the reindeer pavilion quite a lot, and here's where I'm, I'm going to stop on this. Uh, I thought this would be fun because it's the interior design group. This is perhaps one of the smaller projects we've ever done. It's a doll's house. Um, so it's about this big and about that uh, wide. And uh, we wanted to make a really interesting doll's house for young children to understand design while they're playing because doll's houses tend to be pretty traditional. So this doll's house can actually be opened up. You can see it's hinged there. You can just sort of pull it open and it becomes a whole new world inside that you didn't expect. That's the view from the outside. And there's a little door there. That's actually the way you put your hands in and you kind of spread the thing open. And uh, suddenly when you open it, it's this amazing little space. Uh, we designed all the materials, all the, the, the wallpaper, the wall finishes and everything uh, inside this doll's house. We bought some doll's house furniture that you can get uh, from these companies, but we didn't buy any chairs and sofas because we wanted the children to be able to arrange the rooms in the way they would like. There's a tree growing out of one of the floors that goes up through the roof, and you can only see it when you open the, the doll's house through the hinges. And there's a really beautiful little door and if you look closely, um, down at the bottom, there's a little mouse hole right next to the door. And all of these strange patterns that frame the door, uh, we all created as a group in our office. And that's the last picture I wanted to show you. It's the, the little mouse with his own little window and some weird religious artifact there off to the left before he goes into the mouse trap that we also made and a custom designed mouse trap at that scale. So thank you very much. <laughs>